there is a television program called Dragon's Den where entrepreneurs with a very bright idea are given three minutes to pitch their bright idea to some venture capitalists. And those venture capitalists decide which of the entrepreneurs they will invest in. So we identify questions, and then this morning, groups four, and each group should have somebody who will pitch the idea of your group. Each group has three minutes to sell their idea to four eminent people who will listen to the three minute pitch. They will then try and choose the best one. We've asked them to judge, of course, the four criteria attractiveness of the pitch to funders, creativity, mega program relevance, and potential for outcomes and impact. We're looking for an idea that would be researched further afterwards using a very large financial sponsorship from Lilly. In the best traditions of modern television, you each have one beer, and you will be able to co-finance their project. <laughs> okay? So at the end of it, we'll know which is the most popular pitch. And so I think we start with our first pitch, which is climate change. <laughs> so the key element of this project is creating a learning environment for supporting adaptation and building adaptive capacity, both now in the short term, because we know people are coping and adapting with a lot of rapid change, and in the long term, because we also know that in 20 to 30 years from now, climate and other changes are going to be bringing unprecedented stresses to bear on livestock keepers and their families' livelihoods and systems. Now, critical to the way we're going to work on this is building networks, bringing together ILRI with the missing links, these partners on the ground. So really capitalizing on opportunities we know are there that we haven't taken advantage of. So key to this is action research into adaptive capacity both today and tomorrow. Integrating these three knowledges, science, NGO, and community to really make a difference. Now some of the tools that we will use is first, Identifying hotspots of change, multiple types of change, economic, land use, as well as climate. And using this identification process as a way of engaging and communicating with our partners. Now we also, second part of this is we know that people are already adapting. There's unsupported adaptation going on at the community level. There's uh, documented planned interventions going on with NGOs and, uh, and donors um, and, and, and research partners. Um, but this knowledge is not being well documented, well followed up, and it's not getting to people who need it everywhere. The final key component is that it's all well and good to document the change that's happening now, but there's a lot of uncertainty about the change that will happen in the future. And our tool for that is building scenarios and doing learning experiments, again, with these partners on the ground. <laughs> So I'm a professor. I really didn't understand what hypothesis you were testing. Is it just a demonstration or a collection of data or of observations? Or what specifically is your hypothesis in 10 words or less? Our hypothesis is that people are, are adapting to changes, and the research community doesn't understand well enough the impacts of these adaptations and people's needs to go forward into a more uncertain future. It seemed to me the fate fatal flaw in this was, if I could phrase it, I was hungry and you gave me a network. <laughs> solutions actually are about a network of, of knowledge. I mean, solutions are just networking knowledge. And knowledge then translated into actions. That's why we say it's about a program that's about research into use and about short-term and long-term gains. I work for the University of Wagga Wagga and we're always talking about learning networks and adaptation learning uh, and at Sheep Tech we're trying to target a mere 38,000 farmers and we're spending $150 million doing it. How much money do you need to execute your project? Uh, we ten, $10 million over five years because we're going to do a lot of um, leveraging through partners on the ground such as uh, um, the gentleman I met at lunch, Mr. Collins, who comes from Save the Children and actually has lots of projects that he's dying for us to work with him on, and that value that we can add is helping them to document the scientific rigor behind the, the, their practice on the ground. We have $1.2 billion hidden in our gene banks at, uh, at Illinois. 
Um, there was a paper a few years Louder. ago by Mr. Humway, <coughs> and he suggested that planting plant species in rangelands which reflect more light might uh, have a very positive cooling effect on the earth. He suggested that it has an effect on the albedo, which is the reflection of light by the Earth's surface. Snow is having an albedo of 90%, black rocks of 5%, and dry grass something like 25 or 30%. Now, if we could increase the albedo of all the rangelands around the world by 4%, as was suggested by Mr. Hamway, over 5% of 35% of the land surface, that would increase the light which is leaving the Earth system by one watt per square meter. That's about 60% <coughs> of all the CO2 effects of people since 1700, and that has a value of 1 trillion US dollars. <coughs> what would be the benefits of this? <coughs> it might be cooling the Earth, it might reduce poverty because it's bringing in the needed money in drivers, and it might have possibility to restore arrangements as well. May I just for one minute? And I was last week <coughs> at the ILU you experimental minute, station. You have less than one minute left. I was at the ILU experimental station, and I saw the gene bank which we have over there. I think it's a unique opportunity. Nobody else is doing this. Um, we could uh, reduce poverty and uh, improve the environment. We would have better and forest species for livestock because we have the possibility to invest. We might do cross-cutting research in Italy, and it would address MP1, 5, and 7. 30 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 1 1.2 trillion dollar gin bank value. That's the sort of investment we are looking to match as my bank. Can you just give me proof of what you're saying you own and you hold before I go ahead? Well, Is this know. yours? I think the, the, there is a latent value in the LD gene bank because we have a lot of species which have been characterized for the nutritive value and the morphology, but we have never characterized it for the environmental benefits and this albedo effect. So I think there's really an opportunity to look into that and to see whether is there's a potential to manage lands and increase albedo. Now, I'm a farmer, actually, and... Um, I would be more interested in making a selection based on grain yield or on water use efficiency instead of albedo. Why would I possibly want to make a decision for purchasing um, forage crops based on albedo? I understand, but if you bring in money from, uh, from uh, uh, climate uh, <coughs> um, credits, um, you could uh, possibly make more money there than from farming, and that's something to be found out. Uh, there has been uh, uh, suggestions that in agriculture also we should look for crops which reflect more light. And I'm a bit ambivalent about it because there might be a trade-off with the productivity of the crops. Well, I'm totally confused. I'm not quite sure what you want your money for. Are you suggesting that you're going to characterize your gene bank for albedo? And who are you going to tell about this and who are you going to sell it to? <laughs> I think uh, the characterizing uh, the potential of uh, species uh, which are there for influencing the, uh, the radiation balance of the Earth, it's something uh, worthwhile to do, because if you believe these figures, uh, there's a lot of potential in there, and we simply we don't know it at the moment. No. Okay, I think in the last century, we all recognize that there's been several major accomplishments, monumental accom accomplishments. Man has walked on the moon, the CG system was created, <laughs> and in the area of animal health, a much unsung, yet to be recognized, accomplishment, the eradication of rinderpest or cattle plague. Now, all of these accomplishments cost hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. But I don't think we have yet fully understood their impact. In the case of walking on the moon or eradicating rinderpest, it was a very concrete and highly emotive uh, success story. But what does it really mean? What does it mean to farmers? What we want to propose is that we do a full assessment of the eradication of rinderpest, the impacts of the eradication of rinderpest, to better inform policy, both on the part of donors, international organizations, governments, to lead to better animal health programs, improve the return on investment in animal health programs, and encourage further investment in animal health because we can actually talk about how these things work, how they return. And lastly, of course, this will lead to better benefits for farmers and all those stakeholders along value chains. So what we're actually proposing to do is to do a full description of the history, the 
timeline of rinderpest eradication by going out and interviewing and collecting data from the first-hand participants in the actual documents in place. And we want this to be objective, carried out by people who weren't directly involved in rinderpest eradication. And from that, what we want to capture is who are the champions and what was the process to driving this through so that it was carried through to success. But we also want to understand what were their hopes and fears about impacts. How is this going to affect incomes? How is this going to affect trade? One minute remaining. OK. And identify indicators as well as possible confounders. Then with this information, we want to look at the before and after situation for the indicators. And we want to see how those evolved in relation to the process of the uh, eradication, how the strategies changed. Now, the outputs from this process, well, first of all, for the $10,000, what you'll get is a fully costed, fully described proposal. But we want to come out with our homework, which is rigorously reviewed scientific peer-reviewed papers. We also want to come out with more accessible information for the general scientific community, yeah, books and so forth. And lastly, media messages. Very important that these messages get out. And we hope to produce actually a docudrama, the proceeds from which will repay the $10,000 and fund the future eradication of PPR. The world is facing many other diseases which need to be eradicated. You mean you're going to waste these resources looking back over your shoulder at something that was already successful? Well, I think there's some major lessons to be captured here, and we're not sure that selection disease by disease is, is the way forward. Is it an institutional approach where we actually invest in surveillance or some other option? Or is it that we do want to target another disease for eradication? We don't know the answer to that question. So to really inform the process, we need answers. When we put the man on the mood, we gained some wonderful inventions like Teflon. <laughs> when, when we put a man on the moon, we gained some wonderful inventions like Teflon, which replaced cast iron at five times the cost and, and one twentieth of the life cycle, thus creating businesses and industries with no benefit to mankind. And we also invented advanced missile technology, which allows us to kill each other much more effectively. Uh, how do we know that investment in your project is not going to lead to some major negative impacts? <laughs> well, I don't think it will lead to major negative impacts. It might help us to understand how to avoid some major negative impacts. But as with going to the moon, there was a lot of spin-offs, changes in institutions and so forth, lessons learned from rinderpest eradication. And we want to fully capture those. How did institutions evolve in relation to the <coughs> needs for rinderpest eradication? Community-based animal health, different approaches to surveillance, privatization, all those issues. What really happened? When you undertook the work on rinderpest, you had the money for the work that was done in research, the implementation, and there was a component of M&E and impact assessment. You want more money now to tell the same story? What's going to be different? Well, I think this is one of the lessons that will come out, was there's actually very little money invested in M&E. <laughs> very little money. And most of it was through anecdotal information. Um, the majority of the investment went into actual eradication. Some of it, or a large part of it, was probably misspent and not really didn't reach, help us reach the goal. We want to learn which parts, really, which parts of the investment really paid off. OK. Good afternoon. As we're not allowed PowerPoints or uh, flip charts, Bruno and Nereen are my props. Bruno represents CG knowledge. Nereen represents development partner knowledge. OK, what's our problem that we're going to answer with this idea? Grassroots knowledge is only partially understood and utilised in our CG problem identification and defining our research agenda. The future success of the CG relies heavily on its role as a knowledge <coughs> broker, but this knowledge flow needs to be multi-directional, otherwise we will never achieve impressive impact at scale. Question. How can we improve the relationship between research and development partners in terms of knowledge sharing to achieve higher impact of CG research, i.e. this? <laughs> and if we can solve this problem, what are potential outcomes and impacts? Well, firstly, we're going to achieve a systematic and relevant priority setting of livestock research for de development. And also, we're going to increase targeting and impact of ill research to higher numbers of resource poor farmers. Both of these are exactly what our donors want to see. So the objective of our bright idea, identify strategic partnerships and networks of research and key grassroots development actors and design a process for sustainable, multi-directional knowledge sharing. Our proposal with only $10,000 is to show proof of concept of this process, how we're going to do this in a creative way, we're going to identify strategic development partners in key priority countries. Each member of our team will consider one region. We're going to assess and synthesize existing partnerships, networks, 
knowledge and knowledge flows within case study CGR for D-Project. This includes mapping the networks and impact pathways for knowledge exchange and activity of high relevance to MP1. We're going to design multi-directional knowledge sharing instruments to be utilised throughout the new MPs for priority setting. And one of these instruments will include a pilot ILRI-based knowledge exchange hub. If we can show proof of concept, then this process can be extended to other countries and partnership networks and within the CG to the establishment of livestock and other targeted knowledge hubs. In terms of generating additional funds for extending the work out, of, out from proof of concept, we see an opportunity to link this grant to money allocated for partnership management across cutting the MPs. Thank you. Um, at Sheep Tech, uh, we're a highly advanced company and we spend a lot of money developing dubious products that we then spend a lot of money uh, convincing our customers that they absolutely need and hence we make billions of dollars. Uh, tell me, why on earth would I invest in, in, in your approach? Uh, where's the evidence that the knowledge of your partners is actually better than the knowledge you have? We will use this network to say that your product is bad. <laughs> I find the word partners is very easy to say, but in reality we all cannot touch and feel what partnership is all about. Can you in just two sentences tell me what will be different in these partnerships, the strategic partnerships you are looking for? We are looking for two-way communications. Firstly, we would like to bring all the information the partners are the ones who are in direct touch with the grassroots community participants, farmers, located in different regions, different countries. Our partnership will bring the one way, the problems of the farmers, and bring it to the you know, exchange. Here, we realize that individual scientists are working with specific problems. They may not have direct relevant answer. So we have the exchange where there is a facilitator who will synthesize the knowledge required to suit the questions instead of directly approaching the scientist who is working with this. So this way, we have tailor-made answers to the questions raised. The advantage is, in the process, you also get to know the real problems of the farmers at the grassroots level, which will help ILRI to develop new projects in the future. You know, one thing with relying on partners is they can't ask for what they can't imagine. You are the scientist. So why don't you um, provide some leadership in terms of inserting where you think things should be going? That's what we have been doing for the last 40 years. That has not been effective. We want to hear. You know, you, you are trying to feed the people who are not hungry. We would like to look at the hungry people and give them the food. How many of you um, do not have life insurance because you have livestock? Or how many of you do not have a bank account because you have livestock? Or better still, how many of you would use a chicken as an ATM card? Or use a goat as an ATM card? There are people in the world that are doing this. In South Africa, in Western Africa, there are people who need to sell a chicken so that they can pay school fees for their children. There are people who need to sell a goat so that they can take a sick person to hospital. Um, there's also evidence that there's a lot of financial deepening within these rural areas. There are a lot of banks, there's mobile banking and all that that is um, getting into the rural areas and giving financial services to these people. Uh, we are coming up with, an, with a hypothesis that having a bank account or having um, an insurance scheme is actually better than relying on your livestock as a savings plan or as an insurance um, uh, scheme. Some of the benefits of having... Uh, an insurance scheme or having a bank instead of relying on your livestock <coughs> is that the, um, you get to have some productive livestock. If you look at evidence, it will show you that the livestock that they use as insurance or use as um, a savings plan are the ones that are not very productive. If someone is to sell a chicken to take their children to, uh, to school, they wouldn't sell the ones that are laying a lot of eggs. They will sell the other ones. So if they had bank insur uh, banks or insurance, then they would only remain with the productive animals, which means that it will also reduce the impact on the environment. If we have fewer and productive uh, animals, then definitely the environment is sustaining pro uh, very uh, productive uh, issue. And then also, it will reduce the level of poverty for these people because they are, it, they are now not very vulnerable, relying on, very, um, on livestock, which is, could get sick, and they, they, could, they could get sick or they could uh, be affected by drought. One minute remaining. So this process is happening. Financial uh, deepening is happening. We want to investigate how we can help 
uh, the pastoralists take advantage of this, how we can help them save or get insurance schemes so that they don't sink further into poverty. Thank you. So you're advocating that pastoralists should rely on the integrity of the central bank um, instead of their own livestock. And by the way, the livestock will pay a better insurance rate than, or interest rate than most banks. There are cases where the livestock is more productive than putting it in the bank, but there are also lots of cases where it's not, especially when you consider the full cost of keeping animals, including the labor and the potential risks. You know, you're unlikely to get to get a disease from your ATM machine. Though I was thinking I might be getting one from this bird here. But there, when you look at the full cost, there are, there are studies that show that, in fact, the returns to, love, to keeping livestock as a, a savings or as an insurance are not necessarily positive. It's just the only alternative people have. So it's not that we'd want to replace all livestock with savings, but there are people in their livestock whose sole purpose or whose major purpose is, is a non-productive one in that sense. And wouldn't it be better if you could transfer the value of all of that off the hoof and into the bank where it could contribute to economic growth through, um, you know, that can be relate to other people. So you're, you're contributing, you're helping the environment, you're reducing vulnerability, and you're contributing to economic growth and GDP. Let's get to the fundamentals here. People in the village keep their money under the mattress because they do not trust the banking system. And maybe they've been vilified. There's evidence now that things can go wrong. Mm-hmm. Isn't this another gimmick that will steal money from the people? <laughs> do you keep your money under the mattress? Do we? I mean, the banks work for some people. But a big part of the research here would be first to understand why people are resistant to... find First, to look at cases where the financial sector actually has expanded, and what do we find? Do we actually see that people are reducing livestock keeping for those precautionary savings purposes, or don't we? You know, there, there should be evidence, but I think that no one ever links the savings value of animals with the actual financial sector. So there may be, but then we would then, with the results, you work with the financial sector to develop products that actually are better targeted to these users that would deal with the, what are their concerns. And uh, as we were talking, we would have the piggy bank, things like that, to, to address, make products that, that will serve the needs. Because the pool of, of savings might be big enough that it would be worth it for the banks to invest. It seems to me your fatal flaw is you're proposing to use public money to help commercial banks. Surely the world has learned something in the last year. Um, yeah, we, we aren't taking quite a bit of public money. And besides, I don't think we are helping the commercial banks per se. We are helping the pastoralists because when they save the money, they are securing themselves. They are sort of like protecting themselves from sinking into the poverty line when they learn livestock. Are you tired of funding projects that fail? <laughs> that failed to deliver a future for the developing world's children? We have a project that will change all that and put you at the forefront of pro-poor development. Come along with us. We'll turn better production into better lives. We'll do this by improving child nutrition. We'll generate and communicate knowledge to mobilize communities and households to change their behavior. A thousand years of improved productivity will at last be translated into better child nutrition. We all share the costs of productivity enhancing research that has never been turned into better incomes and nutrition. This cost includes disease, death, depression, and disability. Animal-based foods provide a way out. For a malnourished child, one egg will provide enough iodine to actually significantly increase their IQ. These benefits last a lifetime. You come with us. Give that child that egg. (laughs) Why is it and how is it that that increased livestock production can do more harm than good? More animals, more medicines, and more feed mean more work, particularly for women. This affects the amount of time they give to child care and nutrition. Here's what we'll do. Across livestock systems, we'll identify the drivers and modifiers of child nutrition. We'll communicate these within and between communities. We'll work with partners that know the production and marketing systems and offer the best technical support. We'll mobilize the knowledge and use every available medium in training and communication. 
We'll find what works and we'll put it to work. We'll help those communities, but our research will inform and improve every livestock development project in the whole world. <laughs> Together, we'll do research for development. <laughs> Ilri's been in business for coming up to nearly 30 years from its founder institutions. The universities and the research centres around the world that contributed to that founding have been in business for nearly 100 years. What is it that we haven't learned? We haven't actually really learned how we can make sure that increased production and uh, livestock production and increased uh, income from livestock will translate into better child nutrition or human nutrition at all. We actually don't know if increased production will actually mean more, more sale of those livestock products and therefore less, um, less, uh, less, 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 in, uh, less milk or meat for home consumption, or the money from the income will actually be used on something else than expenses. We don't know if the labor needed for increased uh, milk production or meat production will actually mean that women have, le have less time to take care of their children. We don't know that. There's already been demand that's been set up for your services. The current chairman of the AU has said no African child will die of malnutrition in five years' time. Is this the sort of answer we can put on his table as a solution? We are learning? We are learning. We say no African child will face malnutrition. But the truth is we know that when productivity increases, people sell the products and when they sell the products, the income does not come back to the household to improve the, the nutrition of the children. We also do know that when you actually have increased productivity from these livestock, people do not know what to, how to manipulate the quality of the products to actually make a difference to the quality of the livelihoods of the children within the house. So, so we find that um, though we are saying we are increasing productivity, the incomes that are coming from that productivity are being diverted to alternative uses. And the women and children that we target to actually change their livelihoods are not being impacted positively. And there's a lot of private industry that's already working very effectively <coughs> at trying to make money um, selling food to boost children's nutrition. Why don't we just rely on private industry and, and a profit-based <coughs> incentive system to take care of this? It is about uh, increasing as well people's livelihood <coughs> through their own production. And it's not about buying something from outside. So you develop the, the livestock production and at the same time you improve, improve people's livelihood. So I think that's as well as a win-win a win, a win situation. This afternoon we would like to share with you some thoughts about moving from survival to success and why genetics matter. 2010 is the year of biodiversity. <laughs> Yet, livestock and forage diversity is being lost at an unprecedented rate. 600 million poor farmers depend on livestock and are only surviving under the poverty line. Well, the challenge to all this is how can we use genetics to improve productivity, to move them to success, and ensure that diversity is <coughs> remaining for the future? I would like to call our prop. Our prop uh, is an animal breeder, and he's carrying with him <laughs> a small number of highly productive animals. <laughs> These are very blunt instruments for this animal breeder. He's out there using them in a as appropriately as he can, but often inappropriately, and he's causing great damage to biodiversity. <laughs> this provides solutions to one system. We need solutions for several systems to inform better so that income can increase in many systems among many farmers. So what's new? Why do we think we can solve a problem now that we haven't solved in the last 40 years? <laughs> well... Technologies and tools are new. We can now use the new genomic and ICT tools to better understand functional diversity in systems, and also it's going to allow us to work outside traditional species boundaries. 
This work is going to focus on selection of the best genotypes available. One minute remaining. Matching genotypes to system and um, environmental needs. Also improving genotypes using biotechnology tools and ensuring diversity is available for the future. Why ILRI? Well, we think that uh, productivity is going to be very important for moving people from survival to success, and this fits with the CG Consortium goals. Diversity is a global public good, and ILRI has the track record, expertise, and facilities to do this, and if ILRI doesn't do it, who else will do it? So with this, when we do this, we will move 600 million farmers from survival to successful livestock futures. My Canadian friend, Howard Elliott, gave me a great phrase, which he said was déjà vu. <laughs> <laughs> and if you get the point, <laughs> what's new about this? I've heard it all before. We've dreamt about this for 250 years. Now we can do it. Now we have the tools to do it. The cow you're holding there actually looks sort of sick. Um, <laughs> which is what I've seen many improved breeds looking like under poor management in, in pastoral areas. Isn't, isn't management the weak link? And why are we focusing on genetics? <laughs> management is only a part of the, the solution. You need to work on the building blocks. Can you get milk, meat out of management? <laughs> well, that's an interesting response. <laughs> the fatal flaw is can you get meat or milk out of a gene? Well, you don't have cows without genes. <laughs> One person, please, from each of the groups. One of the pitchers to please come up here. We need the dragons to leave us. Whichever direction you would like. With the ultimate, the ultimate venture capitalist investor. Can you do it in about a minute or so? <laughs> please think who you want to vote for and put your beer in one of those baskets. You guys have to. You guys have to. What do you do with the bird? One hundred. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That was just yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. So I the question is, did you feel, do we feel they put I enough think down there to, to actually... I wasn't convinced there was a bankable project there. That was my... Mm. So do we want to put some conditions on it, or do we just want to kill it, or what? Well, of the bankable mm. projects, number two... Two was the bankable yeah. project. Was a bankable project for CG impact, yes. to, to raise the intangible yeah. value to the CG name. I agree. That was the only one I saw out of all the things. Okay, I'd go with that. Which number two? Which number two? Pardon? Which number two? The, the, the render pass. The render pass one. You said it was a blast to the past, basically. Well, that's what we, we, when we, thought, we, we thought it was a very low impact, very unintangible. It was kind of, a, you know... So then the question would be, can he... Building on those lessons, provide a, pro a forward-looking. Well, well, exactly. When, when, I, 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 I think it was the question exactly. We thought it was, we're investment bankers. We're looking for the future, yeah. Yeah. And, and this was all about the past. And, and the link between what they'd learned from the past and the future was just to me. The, to me, the future value with the ball would be the intangible. Yeah. Um, Ilri's reputation, though, everyone would... And now you say Ilri to people and you they don't know who they are. Everyone knows World Health Organization. Oh, yeah, they did smallpox. That was a huge success. And they ride that. Well, how, how about we go, we, we go and say... I mean, I'd be happy to rank those two sort of joint number one for different reasons mm -hmm. and say that our investment banker is not yet convinced which one he should yeah. fund in. Yeah. So... That, so yeah, there's going to be a, an off session round that they have an opportunity but to be. Okay. <laughs> they're going to want to see some money awarded. Yeah, so. People voted for animal genetic resources, uh, which got 25 points, and then. But, yeah. Savings got 24. Child nutrition got 22. Partnerships and disease were both on 14. Land degradation got 19. And climate and other drivers of change got 11. Does that kind of. Uh, match with your decision? Let me say that I, I, we thought that all of the proposals had passion and, and, and made, a, made a good sales pitch, but we're not here about the sales pitch, we're here about the return on our investment. And so, in reverse order, number seven was...
partnerships. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> our, our feedback for partnerships was not that there wasn't a lack of passion, not that partnerships are not important, but we didn't feel that they'd given the investment reason why we needed more networks, more research into partnerships, and how that was going to deliver high value for the institution. So. <laughs> In next ranking, number six. Number six was climate change. <laughs> Excellent and passionate pitch for excellent advocates for, for the livestock keepers, the pastoralists they wanted to serve. But we felt that it was very process oriented. Uh, there was a passionate description of that process. But again, it looked like more networks, more building. We couldn't see what's new and how our return, our investment, yielded a tangible return and, and over what sort of time frame. <laughs> Next in order, number five, plant biodiversity. <laughs> on, the, on the possibly positive side, an excellent pitch, $1.2 trillion worth of value in the gene bank. High return on investment. We felt, unfortunately, it sounded like trading in derivatives. <laughs> there wasn't an obvious link between the investment and the actual return. In fact, we weren't even told what the return was going to be. Um, so it wasn't that we could, that it wasn't worth in, there wasn't something there, but we simply couldn't see that what we were investing in was anything other than a goal up in the sky, um, which, which could be highly risky and no link to, to profit. Next, in reverse order, number four, human nutrition. <laughs> Again, a good passionate pitch, good sales pitch, but again, we were looking at the return on investment. And what we were unclear about, is when you're getting down to the details, is what is it that we don't know? After all this time in working, all these telling the world about the value of livestock and the link between livestock and nutrition, it sounds very odd to us to tell us that we don't actually know if there is such a link or how that link is made. So there's more work to be done there if you want a, a, a high investment. Next, number three, insurance. Excellent delivery, excellent pitch, very passionate and could well be convincing. This is, after all, our number three. Um, getting close to the mark here. But we had concerns about whether or not public money linking to uh, banking, private sector, was the right way to go. We weren't clear if that was involved or not. And given all the issues around banking and given insurance and all the issues around distrust of money, uh, was there a possible risk to our reputation of getting heavily involved in this? And again, the scale of return on investment we didn't feel was, was clearly pitched to us. So close but no goldfish. Okay, so we have two pitches left now. Well, let's start, first of all, with uh, disease. This one, again, we, we felt that we, the team made uh, a cogent argument uh, about lessons that could be learned uh, from past experience. Uh, there was some connection uh, to the future, which is why we liked it. We could see possible benefits, uh, potential benefits to us as investors Ilry as investors, uh, in terms of uh, intangibles, um, in terms of uh, knowledge, uh, of reputation of the institute, uh, the link to um, uh, financial returns, uh, long term was not clear, and we did feel that this was a project that put too much, the pitch put too much emphasis on looking backwards without telling us where the future was going. And we are investors, we're looking to the future, not to the past. So we still saw some strong positives, uh, but some questions in our mind. The other pitch, animal genetic resources. 
again, a passionate pitch, uh, and a clear articulation about uh, what was new. The question was put, we've heard about this before, why now? And very clearly, uh, a, a, a passionate pitch and a clear pitch about new technologies and how they would allow things to be done differently. Uh, but again, we, we had some difficulty seeing the connection between our investment and what that return would be uh, and how it would be delivered. There was an element of deja vu in, the, <laughs> in this proposal. Um, and, uh, and perhaps a, a little bit of thinking to be done uh, about um, uh, we were disturbed, for example, that uh, if you were going to invest in this space that you could expect to get returns by uh, treating genetics in isolation of everything else that was going on. So some strong positives, uh, but also some questions to be asked. So, Dragon Chairman, please announce your decision. The decision is we couldn't choose between the two <laughs> because neither proposal crossed the final hurdle of convincing us that a $10,000 investment would lead to a defined pathway to a return on investment. So, John Richard Branson McDermott, our investment banker, and the team have decided there should be a runoff. What's the question they need to answer? Specifically, how will you use your $10,000 to generate new knowledge or a proposal that will deliver a high return to this institute, this investment bank who is investing in your innovation. And we were deeply shocked that you had got the impression that we were thinking of genetics in isolation. Absolutely everything we were talking about was integrating genetics and <coughs> environment and farming systems in particular. It's all about how, how poor we are currently at matching uh, genotype with environment. So that $10,000 is, 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 is a, a, an initial scoping exercise to allow us to, to, to gather together the, the key players who have got the, the, the molecular resources and the phenotypic resources. What we need to be able to do is tie those two together to build, to build a, the project which will, which will allow us to, to improve genotype, uh, to, to improve the way genotypes match their environment and improve productivity for farmers while archiving the absolutely critical genetic diversity. $10,000 would be used to fully frame the proposal and understand all the nuances and make sure that we have a good design. That's essentially what we'll get for $10,000. But what I want to point out is that this is a relatively low-cost proposal overall, probably a half million to a million dollars, to do a very full and complete job. And the terms of the impact it can have is in tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, not misspent. Yeah? And I noticed that you thought it was looking backward, but actually the need for this proposal comes out in what's going on today as we look at how AI is handled. We're seeing that the lessons of Rinderpest are being lost. We're repeating the same mistakes over and over again. So in a sense, it's very forward-looking in how to inform future policy, and it will be very interactive in its end in how to carry that message forward to decision-makers, to the public, and create new knowledge. See that it's used. We saw that it was quite a tough decision from the dragons. But at the end of the day, in terms of the specificity of how you would use the $10,000, that is what the decision came down to. And so... <laughs> <laughs> Disease wins over... Yeah.